pray to you, God, and we, we, we're not denied, God, you hear us, and God, thank you for your wonderful work, uh, God, I pray you bless us now as we come to your word and sing your praises, God, uh, we got a whole hymn book full of praises, and God, you deserve every single praise in that book, and God, a whole lot more besides that, help us to, God, just be thankful for what you do, and God, uh, God, thank you for your marvelous goodness to us, God. Uh, come back and get us soon, Lord, we pray. Uh, I pray when folks leave here today, God, uh, that they'll know that you've been here and done something in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen.
sweet day, we'll sing up there. The song of victory. Let's turn to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. You know, Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, he had a lot of things to say to people. Now, some of them were hard sayings. Uh, they were hard for people to digest because mainly they didn't want to hear stuff like that. And I understand how that goes. That happens nowadays. Preachers say stuff that folks don't want to hear. And uh, a lot of it was uh, a good and a blessing to people. Uh, very few times did Jesus uh, uh, preach something that was just outright. Uh, the longest sermon he ever preached was negative. Um, Matthew 23's uh, dressing the Pharisees down. But this here in Mark 11 is the only time that I know of in the scriptures that Jesus Christ cussed something out. And he cursed it. And uh, you say, well, Jesus cut. No, well, when you give a curse, it's a real curse. And you're the son of God. It's not really cussing like we know it. It wasn't a sin in this case. Um, this morning, I'm going to preach on the figless, the figless tree. Let, let's look at verse number 12. Mark 11. The Bible says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. Now, okay, so they're, 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 uh, they're coming from Bethany back into town, okay? And uh, this, this is the week before he got crucified. And he sees in the distance a fig tree. Now, Fig trees have these nice big leaves on them. Uh, and when they're in fig season, uh, these leaves get all, all big and green. And, and from a distance, it's easy to say that's a fig tree. Fig trees kind of have a weird little shape. And so he, he looks at that, and he looks at this tree, and it's got, it's got all these leaves on there. Now, the time of year it was, maybe it wasn't the peak of fig season, in fact, it was kind of early, but the best figs that come off a fig tree are the ones that come off real early. Boy, they're the sweetest and the best. So he looks down the lane, and he sees this tree. If happily he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. Like I said, it wasn't peak fig time. Uh, fig time usually isn't until June or uh, maybe July at, at latest. Uh, but this was probably like uh, uh, April. And Jesus answered and said unto it. He talked to a tree. Sometimes I talk to objects. People think you're weird to talk. Jesus talked to objects. Of course, he made it. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Look at verse 19. Okay, so they go and do their thing. And now they're coming back out of town. And when it was evening, was uh, and when evening was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said, "Saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedest is withered away." And Jesus answering saith unto them, "Have faith in God." For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, uh, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things uh, which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever, uh, uh, What things soever ye desire... When ye pray, believe and ye shall uh, that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. All right, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive, for ye have ought uh, for. I don't get this straight. Forgive if ye have ought against any, 
Got that? That means you have a grudge or something, or something you need to forgive somebody of. That your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Help us now as we look at this scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, fig trees are nice to have around. I have one in my backyard. I have one for a long time. It's a good thing to go out in the morning when the sun's coming up real good and strong and go around around the fig tree and, and pick them things. I like them right off the tree. So do the birds. You got to beat the birds to them because if you don't get up early, the birds will get them all. But you get around, you find that, you find that uh, fig tree there and you find that ripe fig and you pick that off and you, st I, I just eat it skin and all. Boy, that thing just bursts into your mouth or just like eating candy. A healthy fig tree uh, can almost have fruit on it almost all year round, except for the real cold uh, parts of the year, especially in a climate like uh, the Middle East over there. Uh, sometimes the fruit does not ripen during the summer or fall, but is able to make it through the winter till early spring. And this is probably the case we're looking at here. Uh, sometimes uh, figs will be left over because it didn't get that cold that winter and the fig will just survive. And then when the warm weather starts uh, coming around, it'll start to get bigger. Uh, now, figs need uh, several things to grow. Uh, they need a nice sunny place to grow. They need lots of water. Um, and, uh, you know, if they're sickly, they need some uh, uh, fertilizer a little bit. Um, and, and there's no expectation that a fig can't give you good figs all the time unless one of those things uh, goes away. But when Jesus came up to this tree, he didn't find figs. Or if he did have, see figs, they were little old green knotty things that weren't big enough. And then you put one of those into your mouth, you're going to spit it out. They're nasty. All you really saw was leaves. So he didn't have any leftover figs from last year. And the figs hadn't come along. And he was hungry. And when the creator of the universe is hungry, uh, you know, it's time for the fig tree to make some figs. And he cursed it. Now what is this a type of? Well, in the Garden of Eden, remember when Adam and Eve sinned? What did they do? They went and got fig trees, and they covered themselves. They made little clothes, fig tree clothes. And when God saw them, I imagine he was taken aback. And they were trying to hide their sin with something else. That's called self-righteousness. And God really doesn't like that kind of righteousness. Matter of fact, the reason he does it is because it really doesn't benefit anybody whatsoever. It doesn't benefit the person that's got it. It doesn't benefit the people that are looking for something spirit, really spiritual and true. It's kind of a fake thing. Now, some of this passage of scripture, we have to be a little careful. Because God will forgive your sins even if you don't forgive other people. You look at the New Testament. Now, he tells Christians you ought to forgive people because God forgave you. But here, the Gospels, he hadn't died on the cross yet. Things were a little different. This is kind of a, a Jewish thing. This is the millennial thing. And I hate to tell you this, despite what Brother Homer preached for years, and I believe he did move a mountain with some faith, but it took a while. Uh, this, I, I, I kind of always took this, the mountain just kind of levitates and goes plump into the sea. Well, you try it. See if it works. Go to Lookout Mountain up there in Chattanooga and give this a try. I don't care how much faith you got. Uh, God doesn't do things like that in this age. He does different things. He works through his word. He works subtly through the Holy Spirit of God. But the point of my sermon is, is we as Christians owe God something. We owe him fruit. After all, he comes and he works with us. He saves us. And when he looks at our life, he wants to see something that's grown. Something that's going to be worth something to him. The main problem with this tree. Three things I'm going to preach on. The main problem with this tree, first of all, had no figs. No figs. None. 
Not a one, not a green one, not, not one that was half eaten by the birds that had no figs. Now, having had figs for years, uh, there's nothing more disappointment than some bird that's half eaten. They never eat the whole fig. They peck a hole in it or they eat half of it. Or the, the squirrels are even worse. They don't even like figs. They just want to try them. So you see them, they'll spit it out. They'll spit the bite out. They took the fig and the rest of the fig. They want to hang in there. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about root. I'm talking about no figs whatsoever. And this doctrinally here is a picture of the nation of Israel. You know, God had called the nation. He had started the nation. He gave them the law. He preserved them. He gave them kings. He, he looked, and looked after them. And he expected them to obey him and produce some fruit, the fruit of righteousness. And, and you know, they didn't do it. Uh, look on your sheet. Number one, A. Where's that from? That's from Romans chapter 10. Look what Paul said about the nation of Israel. Let's read carefully what it says. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. One of the best things, the fruits that God wants out of uh, anybody, America, Israel, He wants people to be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You know, there's a lot of religious people. There's a, there's a lot of religious nuts out there. I mean, we got a religion that it's okay if you put a bomb, strap it to your chest, and go blow people up. That ain't right. You got people that, uh, you know, certain times of the year, they'll strip their clothes off and they'll whip themselves going down the street till they bleed. Certain parts of the world, they, they tie themselves to crosses and things. That's a bunch of nut. That, that's, that's zeal with no knowledge. And, uh, look, some people are very religious. They go to church every time the doors are open. They, uh, they, 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 say, they have little prayer books. They say the prayers. They sing the songs. They go to the service. They get up. They get down. They get up. They, you know, they do all this stuff. And they're very zealous about it, some of them, but they have no knowledge of what they're doing. They really don't know Jesus Christ. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish what? Their own righteousness. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Look, as a saved person, I have submitted myself to the righteousness of God. And when Jesus walked up to that tree... All he saw was leaves. And leaves are fine. It takes a lot of work for the plant to make leaves. But leaves is not the point of a fig tree. You know what figs are for? Figs are a seed pod. That in nature that's supposed to land on the ground and make other little fig trees. Then birds are supposed to eat them figs and go out and poop the seeds and plant more fig trees. But if you got a tree that's not got no fig, it's not even good for the tree. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. It's a shame the Jews didn't believe their Messiah when he came. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the next verse. I didn't print it there because I thought you knew it. Israel had no fruit. All they had was leaves. Peter. Peter had a little self-righteous problem. It's, it's no wonder Peter made comment about this. Probably stuck him right here. And, and, and not only did this picture of Israel having no fruit, but it pictures a Christian with no fruit. 
Look, you can be saved, and you can go to heaven, and you can spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ and have a wonderful time in heaven, but if you lose your fruit, if you don't make any fruit, things are not going to be as blessed as what you think they're going to be. God wants to bless you here. God wants to bless you in heaven, extra special, but you've got to have some fruit. Salvation is not the only thing. Christian, he wants fruit. He wants fruit out of your life. James chapter 3, there on your page under B. This is the wisdom that sendeth from above. Oh, this is the wisdom that sendeth not from above. Excuse me. That's what it says. It is earthly. So, the wisdom that ain't from heaven is earthly. Sensual. Devilish? For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above, there is the right kind of wisdom, is first pure. How about some purity? That's a fruit. Then peaceable. Are you got peace in your life? Gentle. There we go. Easy to be entreated. In other words, if somebody says, forgive me, you say, oh, yeah, sure, fine, I forgive you. Full of mercy and what? Good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Look, when you got the real peace of God and you got some real fruit in your life, uh, it's going to show. People people know they can come to you and say, pray for me. People know that you're not going to uh, judge them. Um, there's a, the, I've heard this story from more than one person. Uh, they say they got down on their knees when they got saved and, they, and, they, and their language was horrible. Yet most wise soul winners will not rebuke that person for cussing or something in their prayer when they get saved. Because they're lost when they're praying. And they, and they know there's faith in that person's heart. And you know what? God saves people like that. And God cleans people like that up. And people like that end up their life changing. And they have fruit in their life. That's the trouble with some of us old church people that get saved. There's not a lot of difference between our former life and the life that we live after. And sometimes the fruit is hard to see. Most of the fruit in the Christian life is in here. Now, you ought to win some souls in your life if you're a Christian. Let me tell you. My fig tree in my backyard. If you go into my fig tree right now, it's got little green knotty figs on it. And probably it's not going to have any much more. I might get two, three, four, maybe a dozen figs off my tree this year. When I planted that tree, it was in a sunny part of the yard. Then some goofy people came in my backyard to work on my septic tank and they cut the tree nearly in half. It took a couple years for it to grow back. Once it growed back, that tree was prolific. One year we had so many figs we couldn't give them away. Uh, so we ended up canning them and we made what? Fig bread we called it. And we gave a bunch of that away. And we gave fig jelly away. The next year we made fig jelly. And uh, uh, the next year we, had, we ate a bunch of them. And, and it went on like that for four or five years. And then what began to happen is we had no big trees in our yard. But our neighbors have great big oak trees. And the branches that were sticking over in our yard got longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. And all of a sudden, one year, the figs didn't ripen the way they should. And I looked up and said, ah, I need sunlight. So I got up on my ladder, and I was able to trim some of them branches and get some sunlight in there. But so many years have passed, and those branches have gotten so big and tall and high that I can no longer get and trim them. So there's no light to my fig tree anymore. Thus, I have no figs. There's no figs on that tree. Just leaves. It got so bad that an ant colony established itself in the, the bark of my, uh, the trunk of my fig tree. And I had to cut half of it out to get rid of the ants. Now, it's healthier, but I still ain't getting no figs. What are you thinking about doing? Well, I think I might just cut it down and start again plant it further, further up. Either there or spend a couple thousand dollars and people cut them trees. So I'll have the world's most expensive figs when I get them. Amen? 
It's fortunate that you have a God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. It don't matter how much it costs to get fruit in your life. And God's fertilized some people and he's watered some people and he's, he's to put his light on your life and he wants some fruit. But this tree had no figs. And not only that, but because Jesus Christ cursed it, it had no favor. It had no favor. Uh, no favor was gained with Jesus. He come up there and seen them old leaves. And that's not what he wanted. Well, when God looks at your life and he examines your life, you need to have what God wants out of your life. You say, well, my life don't belong to God. Yes, it does. Don't belong to you no more. You are bought with a price, the Bible says. Colossians 1.10, under number 2 on your sheet there. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Who's, who are you pleasing? God. You're not pleasing yourself. Unto all pleasing, being what? Fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I, boy, Christians nowadays, I mean, you meet people and, and they say, I'm a Christian. Well, you wouldn't know there was a Christian with a microwave and a, a laser beam and a, a microscope and a telescope and an x-ray and everything else. Just looking at them, you couldn't tell if they was Christian or not. The way they dress, the way they talk, the way they act. Look, if you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian! Please God with your life. Before you leave the house in the morning, look yourself in the mirror and say, does this please God? And if you can say yes, leave the house. If you say no, go back and change. At the end of the day, you need to look at your day and say, what I did please God? And if it ain't pleasing to God, you need to confess it and say, Lord, I messed up and I sinned. Forgive me. And he promised to forgive you. There's no favor gained. And, and, and you know, some Christians don't listen. They just don't listen. God tells them, and they go a little for, you know, they might get right for a couple days, a few weeks, a month, and then they go right back into it. Uh, us preachers sit around scratching our head wondering if a person like that's really saved. Because we can't tell. Because the only way. Other Christians and preachers can tell if somebody else is saved by what their fruit is. And when there's no fruit, who can tell? Sometimes the only way we can tell is if God is beating them half silly. Because God chastens his children. And some Christians, they go further on and they get cursed. You say, God curses some Christians? Yeah, I've seen, God, I've seen God curse some Christians. Look, I know a fellow right now, and he got into some sin, and his pastor told him he better behave and keep himself clean. Well, he did for a good while, and you know what? He decided he wasn't going to after a while, and he got right back into this stuff. You know what God's done to that fellow? He's cursed him. He's having the worst time you ever seen. So where is he at? Well, he's in jail right now. Probably won't stay there all the time. His house is messed up. His life is messed up. His income is messed up. His family's messed up. So what is that? You say, is he saved? Probably. Because there's been times I've seen him walk with the Lord. There's been times when I've seen this guy close to God. But you, you do stuff and you keep doing it and God warns you and warns you and warns you and warns you. God does bad things to people to get their attention. Oh, I tell you what. Don't ever get in a circumstance in your life where God wants to do this to you. Stay right with God. Please God. Matthew 21, 41 says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth fruits thereof. He's talking to the Pharisees and the leaders of the nation of Israel. And he says, look guys, God's trying to make you do stuff and bring forth fruit. He's giving you thousand years of all this history and you've done nothing with it. And you're going to keep on. God's just going to turn to somebody else and say, here, you take the blessings for a while. For 2,000 years, the Jews have sat on the shelf waiting for God to 
get them down off the He will one day. He's not done with them forever. But boy, that's how we got in. Because he cursed the other. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Every man's work shall be manifest. This is you, Christian. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work, what so sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be said, yet so is by fire. Some Christians are going to be standing there and there's going to be this big bonfire and when it's all put out, there's not going to be anything left. What a shame. I hope, I hope there, there's something left for me. Years ago, uh, uh, J.M., a minor, he was age 18. He was severely born, burned in a coal mine accident. Uh, by one of those explosions of uh, inflammable air, which uh, often proved fatal, but it didn't kill him. Uh, one of his fellow workers uh, suffered and died uh, three days after the explosion, but J.M., he unexpectedly recovered. In about three months, he was healthy enough to return back to the coal mine. But he wasn't improved spiritually, however. By his recent narrow escape from death, he immediately relapsed into his former wicked manner of life, even though he was a professing Christian. One Saturday evening, he agreed with several of his companions to rob a store and was heard on the occasion using blasphemous words, cursing the same God who had mercifully restored him to health. But this would be the last time he ever blasphemed God. For while they were in the getaway car, the driver suddenly lost control and drove headlong into a telephone pole. All the passengers of the car were killed, including J.M. Thus he died in the very bloom of youth, a man of a young man of bad testimony, vicious habit, and unfortunately a depraved heart. You can't run from God, folks, and you can't fool him either. No figs, no favor. No fooling. No fooling. No fooling. And, 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 and mark that the passage is about the kingdom of heaven. It's about the nation of Israel. But individually as Christians, God treats you about the same way as he did the whole nation of Israel. God gives you so many blessings. He gives you His Word. He gives you the Spirit of God. He sends Christians to help you and preach to you and teach you. Oh, Christian, if I were you, I'd be praying God takes some of that stuff that He gives you and God gets in there and, and, and stirs it around and makes some fruit out of your life. God gives you what you need. In this life. No fooling. He gives you what you need. Uh, Philippians. Philippians. Chapter 1 verse 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent. That ye may be sincere. Without offense to the day of Christ. That's Paul's prayer for the Philippians. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Which are who? Which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Those fruits that you get, those are for God's glory. Those are for God's benefits. He He wants to He wants to take your fruits and brag about it. Here, look at angels. Look Look at what my Christian did. Look, hey, hey, devil. Look, look what, what, what that Christian sister did down there. Isn't it so good? Isn't it so good? God gives you what you need through Jesus. God gives you prayer and faith. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, 4. Chapter 1, verse 4. I thank God, my God, always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given to you, what? By Jesus Christ. Again, given to you by Jesus Christ. That in everything you are enriched by Him, in all utterance, in all, and in all knowledge, even... 
as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. That enrichment <laughs> is like fertilizer. God, God, God comes down and he looks at your life and you need some things. So God will give you the things you need. And that comes through prayer and faith. You say, faith? Yeah. Sometimes you've got to have faith in God. Jesus said if you had faith, you could do just about anything you needed to do. Now, in, in this age, he's not talking about moving mountains or, or making figs pop out on a tree. He's talking about, about things in your life that need changing. Sins you need to conquer. People you need to reach. Uh, works you need to do uh, for God. God, you got to have faith to do those things. And who do you have faith in? Not yourself, but Jesus Christ. That's why you do them. That's, that's who we're trying to glorify here. These people that wrote all these hymns in this book, they didn't write all these hymns so you'd say, oh, Fanny Crosby, didn't she write good songs? That's not why she wrote them songs. Oh, P.P. P. Bliss didn't write them songs. They, oh, P.P. P. Bliss was a good song. No, no, uh-uh. They wrote them to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to uplift Him. This thing is from me. How can a God of love, who has everything in his control, let such a thing happen to me? So a young woman asked her pastor after she had received severe injuries from a fall from a horse. Crippled for life, she said the doctor told me. So the pastor was silent for a moment. And he asked her, did you suffer much pain when they put you in a cast? She said the pain was terrible. Where was your father then? Well, my dad was standing right beside me. Oh, okay. Did your father allow the doctor to hurt you anyway? Even though he was standing right there? Well, yes, but that was necessary. Did your father allow the doctor to, to hurt you even though he loved you or because you loved him? Well, yeah, because they had to set me in a cast. You mean to suggest that because God loves me, he allowed me to be hurt? And the pastor answered with a nod. He said, this thing is for me. That's what God tells us a lot of times. We've got to let those words comfort us sometimes because sometimes life gets rough. We get hurt. But you know what God's trying to do? He's trying to bring about fruit. Look, when those ants got into my fig tree, I didn't go out there and pat the little fig tree and say, Oh, poor fig tree. You've got ants that are killing you. You know what I did? I went to the shed and I got the biggest bow saw I could find. And I went down to the root of that branch where all those ants were in. And I went. <laughs> and I saw some more ants. So I went a little lower. And I saw it again. And I kept sawing until I didn't see no more ants. And then I put that in a burn pile and burned them. Why? Because if I hadn't, my fig tree would be dead right now. Luke 13, 6, Jesus tells a little story. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then he said unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumber fit the ground? And he answered and said to him, Lord, let it alone this year also. I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Look, God gives you everything you need. And he'll try hard. God doesn't want to hurt his Christians. God doesn't want to do mean things to your life. But he does some fruit. God, God wants 
you to keep a good heart. He wants you to be thankful. He wants you to be faithful. He wants you to be kind and forgiving. Psalm 65, there on the bottom of the back side of your sheet, bottom of the page. Thou visited the earth and water strip. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy path drop fatness. They drop uh, upon the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice upon every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks and the valleys also are covered with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. That's a picture of abundant Christian life. God comes down and showers out his blessings and Christians grow the fruit that he wants. And what happens? Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. This sermon is more how to keep God happy than anything else. Fruitful Christian life. In conclusion, I want to say this. A fig, a fig is a sweet treat. It's full of sugar. It's not the thing you want to eat all the time uh, uh, to get big muscles or anything. You eat enough of them, it'll make you like this. But boy, there's nothing better than getting that sweet treat when you ain't had something sweet in a while. It's a picture of God's blessings. He wants the taste of your life and he wants to come down and taste that sweetness. Of your life. And God says, Mmm, that's a good fig. John 15, 8. Jesus said, Here is my Father, herein is my Father glorified. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear just a little bit of fruit. Is that what it says? No, much fruit. Much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. You want to be God's disciples? You want to make him happy? You want to avoid beating, getting, getting beaten, chastised? Bear that fruit. Open Door Baptist Church needs some fruit. Christian, we need some fruit. Y'all have heard of a guy named Lawrence of Arabia. Well, Lawrence of Arabia, he ended up uh, associating with a bunch of these uh, Muslim tribesmen over there in uh, Arab uh, lands. And after World War II, he brought a bunch of them to visit in Paris with him. And uh, he showed his uh, new friends around. He showed them the Eiffel Tower. Uh, he showed them the Ark of Triumph. He showed them the Louvre. He showed them Napoleon's tomb. He ran them up and down the Champs-Élysées. Uh, but nothing seemed to impress these stone-faced Arabs very much. The thing that really interested them, that got them really excited, was in the hotel room. He took them to the hotel and got them settled in the room. And uh, after a while, he, he came knocking at the door. And, and uh, fi finally, uh, one of them came and, and said, oh, come with us. It's marvelous. And he found all of them in the bathroom. And they, they were all crowded around the bathtub. And they were turning the faucet on and turning it off. And turning it on. And turning it on. And they said. Isn't this amazing? You turn this little knob here. And you get all the water you ever want. I guess it would be something amazing. From people from a desert country. That didn't have much water in their life. So. A couple days later. They were getting packed up. And ready to leave. And Lawrence went in to check on them. He found a couple of them in the bathroom. They had bought some wrenches somewhere. And they were trying to take the faucets out of the wall. And they said, we want to take these with us. They didn't understand. And Lawrence had to explain to them, look, these faucets aren't going to do you any good. You can take them back with you. And, and when you get home, you can turn them on and off all you want to. There's no water coming out. Why? Well, he had to explain that, you know, they're hooked to pipes and that's hooked to somewhere, a big reservoir somewhere, a river somewhere, lots of water. And so you ain't got nothing to hook it up to. You ain't going to get 
no water. It's just a, a transportation device for water. Well, that's where a lot of Christians are. They, they, they think just because they got the trappings of what looks like might have water, it, it's just, it's an unhooked up faucet. A fruitless faucet, as it were. Christians, let's all pray. Let's all ask God to give us some fruit in our life. Uh, fruit benefits the tree. It makes the tree grow. Makes more trees grow. Uh, it feeds the birds. It feeds the owner of the fig tree. And it's a good testimony that God is working and doing stuff in your life. So let's be good little fig trees and make some figs for God. Amen? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. God, uh, we live in an age that uh, is mechanized and technological. Everybody goes to the store and they, they buy fruit out of a bin. They buy uh, meat in a package. They buy vegetables in a can. Uh, they buy stuff that's been processed and wrapped up. And Most people nowadays don't know what it is to grow anything. But God... There's many, many places in the Bible you liken us to a plant or a tree or some kind of fruitful thing that benefits others as well as the plant itself. God, please, whatever we need, whatever water we need, whatever light we need, whatever fertilizer we need, God, help our lives. God, work with us. Dig around us. Prune us up, whatever needs to happen, so that God one day, God, when the summer comes and it's time for fruit, God, people can look at our lives and they can see God's work. And they can give you the glory for what you've done. Help us now. As we go, God, there's, there's really no way to give an invitation for this, Lord. If there's somebody that wants to come right now, Lord, help them to come. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I, I, the Lord said give an invitation anyway. So I'm going to give an invitation anyway. If you need to come down and pray about your fruit, come down and pray. Say, God, I, I'm having trouble. I'm struggling. The bugs have gotten the fruit. The, the birds have gotten the fruit. The, 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 I ain't got enough water. I ain't got enough light. I ain't, I ain't got enough uh, nu nutrients. God, help me. Lord, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to be ashamed when he comes. When we stand before him, what's going to be left in that fire? Are you going to have a, a pile of a little something to give him? To offer the Lord and say, Lord, this is yours. Lord, help these folks as they go. I pray you bless them. Help them to think about what I've said this morning. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.